get started. It's a few minutes past our start time. Uh, my name is Brian Maddy. Uh, I'm a software developer. Uh, I'm working at a place called Vidku, a startup. We're moving into Minneapolis real soon. Well, we're at the U of M right now, but we're going to be moving to this really cool space downtown Minneapolis. Uh, let's see. I've been writing code for about 20 years. Uh, most of it's been doing Ruby and some JavaScript. Uh, I also four or five years ago started the local Clojure user group because I discovered Clojure and realized, wow, this language is really cool and very elegant and wanted to learn more. And so every month a couple of us get together and talk about Clojure and what's going on in that world. And anyone's welcome to come. It's Clojure.mn. Uh, as I'm talking, feel free to interrupt me with questions. I work best when people just ask me questions and we can chat and maybe we'll find something even more interesting to talk about than the stuff I've prepared. So please speak up. Today we're talking about state immutability and persistent data structures. But first, before we get to that, I want to make a paper rec recommendation. So this paper is called Out of the Tar Pit, Functional Relational Programming, which you might think is FRP, but it is in no relation to functional reactive programming. That's a, that, that's a totally different thing. And uh, if you want to learn more about that, you should uh, certainly chat with Colin back there, or I think there's someone else doing a talk on that later today as well. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, this paper is awesome. Uh, it's, it's not one of these really dense academic papers. It's, it, it reads kind of like a blog post, so it's you know for normal people, and it, it goes through a lot of stuff that I'm actually going to be talking a little bit about in this talk. So I got a lot of the ideas from here, so this is some of the inspiration. So the plan for today is we're going to talk about the amount and impact of mutable state. Uh, then we're going to differentiate between identity versus value. And then the benefits of less mutable state and what we can do right now in our code. So have you guys heard some of, the, heard some of these phrases before? Yeah, we all have. Restart the machine. Reload the page. You know, try reinstalling everything. Oh, it must have been a fluke. It worked the next time. So, what's that? <laughs> yeah, restart with a different operating system doesn't actually count here. <laughs> but, but yeah, right idea. Um, so, every time you hear one of these phrases, what you've witnessed is an error caused by some developer who incorrectly handled mutable state. Because if it works the second time around, that means the first time around you were in a bad state. So mutable state kind of sucks. It's, it makes things hard. Uh, to get an idea on how much state we're talking about, so if we have one bit in our program, that means we have two states. For comparison, uh, the number of atoms on planet Earth is 2 to the 167, which is slightly less than six 32-bit longs in C. Uh, also for comparison, the number of atoms in the universe is 2 to the 266, which is slightly less than five numbers in JavaScript. So we have a huge amount of possible states in our programs. Uh, eight gigs of RAM, well that's big, right? That's not surprising. So uh, state affects the probability of our programs being correct. Uh, Edgar Dijkstra, a famous computer scientist, came up with this little equation a long time ago. If we have a part of our program, a part of our program could be a line or a function or a class or a file, it doesn't really matter. Say a part of our program has some probability of being correct. If we've got n parts to our program, then the probability of our entire program is being being correct is p to the n. This is all the math we're going to do today. <laughs> so, so we have five parts, p times p times p times p. Yep. Then it's p to the five. So if we assume each part of our program is a high number, we'll say 97% correct. It turns out if we get up to about 50 parts in our program, we've got less than a one in four chance of our program being correct. Because it increases, or it, the probability of correctness decreases exponentially. So Dijkstra's argument after talking about this was that we need to 
uh, reduce the quality and quantity of our coupling between components, which is what we do every day, right? We say make sure this module depends as little as possible on other modules. And the reason that this makes it more probable for our cro programs to be correct is because then we can verify correctness of these modules independently without the context of our entire program affecting it. And then we'll know that that's correct, and then it's more likely to be correct when used in our program as well. So shared state is kind of like coupling between parts of your program. Because if A uses some mutable state, and B, well, A, so we have two parts in our program, A and B. If A uses mutable state, then it depends on B to not screw up that mutable state or get it into a bad state. Uh, so one thing that's really nice in our programs is uh, pure functions. And the reason these are nice is because we can verify them independently. There's, there are parts of our program that are completely separated from, they have very, well, no dependencies on the rest of our code. So if we have, for example, oh, so when I, so when I say a pure function, I mean a function where if you give it, if given, given an input A and that gives a B as an output, then in any situation, a, giving it an A will return a B. It doesn't depend on anything changing in the rest of your program. Also has no side effects. So side effects would be like logging or updating a variable like a counter somewhere else or something like that. So if we say we have an error in our pure function, well then we know the problem is either in that function or in the argument passed to that function. So our search space for when trying to solve this problem is that function or maybe the function that used it, which is pretty small. Now, if we have an impure function, well, we know, say we have a bug in an impure function, then we know the problem that we're trying to solve is either in that function, in the information being passed to that function, or some child function that it's using is updating some state, and we don't think it should be, or maybe something off in a different thread is updating the state it's using, so the search space for figuring out where this bug is is actually the entire program. So mutable state affects our ability to reason about our programs. Mutable state also pollutes functions. Uh, so let's say we have a pure function or a function that doesn't use state, and it does a bunch of stuff, and then someone comes in here later and says, hey, I'm going to add some mutable state in there for some reason or another, well, all of a sudden, our function that was nice and pure and easy to reason about has become stateful. And every function that uses it has become stateful. And it goes straight up to the chain to every place that that, that function is used. So we lose these uh, uh, nice ways of easily reasoning about our functions when we introduce mutable state deep in our programs. Mutable state also affects concurrency. So this is probably a classic problem, but well, it is a classic problem. But so say we have two functions, double and triple. You can probably guess what they do. Double multiplies by two and triple multiplies by three. In this first case, that so double and triple are uh, associative, so we it's a good candidate for uh, running concurrently. So in this case, when double runs first, it reads a 1, writes a 2, then triple reads the 2 and writes a 6, and that's correct. If they got the other way around, like I said, it's associative, which means we can swap the order. So triple reads a 1 and writes a 3, then double reads the 3 and then writes the 6. So what about this case? It doesn't work as well, right? Because we're reading and writing at different times, because this is mutable state. So it reads the 1, and then the double writes a 2, but then the triple writes a 3, and that's the wrong answer. And then here's another case. This case, in this time, you know, triple happens to get to it first, but still writes before double is finished, so we end up with a value of 2, which is also incorrect. 
then we have another one, also incorrect, and also incorrect. So two out of six, that's, that's pretty terrible. I mean, maybe it'll happen that way. But two out of six possibilities of these things being run, and, well, six of possibilities, and four of them are bad. So mutable state also impacts testing. Uh, so it, when, you, when you test one state of your application, this is something Dijkstra said again. He's kind of my favorite computer scientist, if you can't tell. He said that testing one state of your application doesn't necessarily tell you anything about testing another state of your application. And also, we as developers tend to test the really, really simple cases, which is unfortunate. But makes it easier to figure out our tests. So if we add more states, then we have many more states that we have to assume are correct, basically. Um, and like I said before, every bit that you add doubles the possible states. Uh, also, just another good reminder from Dijkstra is program testing can be used to show the presence of bugs but never show their absence. So that goes right along with the testing one state doesn't tell you anything about another because it could be bad in that state. So what if we got rid of all state? Anyone know Haskell here? They like that. Oh, wow, cool. A lot of Haskell developers. More than I expected. That's awesome. Um, so everything's a pure function. This is great, right? Fibonacci's perfect. It's, it's no problem. What if we have, let's try and change a, a counter to being not using any state. So right now we've got our basic mutable counter. We've got this get next counter function. The count is declared elsewhere, so we can update it. And we just increment it and return it, no problem. Well, if we don't allow, if we don't allow any mutable state in our program, well, then we can't really update count, so we have to end up passing it in. And the way you can of often uh, make this transformation is by passing in a new thing that uh, you'd pass in the counter, and then you'd also have to return something else that allows the function to continue its computation later. So what you'd end up doing this seems a little contrived, right? Because new count and result are the same thing. But imagine you had lots of functions like this that needed some kind of, you know, pseudo mutable state. And then you'd probably end up passing in a map of all sorts of values and it would know which which value to extract out of there and return a new map with the updated value. But here we end up getting into basically the same situation of our map of all these values is kind of like mutable state. And using it really kind of sucks because we have to keep track of this state-like object. So we, we end up getting back into the same spot. Uh, one, one way around this is using monads. I don't know anything about them. They're confusing. I'm sure the Haskell people in this room would disagree strongly. All right, so sometimes it's nice to be able to use mutable state uh, for things like counters, where it's just something so simple we don't want to make it extra complex by uh, having mutab uh, immutability. Also, mutably is, is how we think of the world. Like when we when we say I'm in Minnesota, right, where we're declaring my current state versus some other state. It's it's just how we've thought about the world in a for a really long time. So the qu next question, next obvious question is, so can we minimize our use of mutable state? Well, one thing we can do is to differentiate between essential state and derived state. So essential state would be the core parts of your program. This would be like stuff you put in your database or information that uh, your users give you 
in some way or another. Or say maybe if you're writing a game, it would be not every key stroke, but maybe the current position of the player. So the core things in our program. Uh, and then derived state would be anything that's a function of that essential state. So if my essential state was I had this user object and it had maybe a first name and a last name, the first name and the last name would be the essential state. And then the derived state would be my full name, which is first name, space, last name. So the thing about uh, the derived state is it can always be calculated from the essential state. So we don't really want to update it right there in place. It would be much better to update the mutable, the essential state and then recalculate it, our derived state, from that because we, we get a more consistent experience. Uh, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is identity versus value. And this is the kind of the big thing I wanted people to get away from this presentation is the distinction between identities and values. So we think, so identities are a succession of values for a variable in our normal programming languages, our identity would be the variable and our value would be one of those values in a particular point in time. So, uh, we could look at file version backups. So if we've got a file on our, mach our machine and we change it and then save it, we still say it's the same file, right? But it has a new value. And heck, it could be a completely different spot in a completely different spot on the disk. But we still, we still say it's, it's the same, the same uh, file. So I'm going to show you real quick what this looks like in Clojure. All right, because uh, everyone see that okay? Wow, this would be a great time to have a mic stand, wouldn't it? So, let's see how this works. <laughs> I'm going to, okay, all right, you know I'm going to do this. Does that work? Okay, so, up on the top here, I've got some code that I'll be evaluating. Um, it's really simple code. You don't have to know Clojure to do this at all. Uh, on the bottom is the Clojure REPL. That stands for a read eval print loop. So I'll run the code in the top and it will, and then way, way on the very bottom, you'll see if I run something at the top, you'll see that way down there. So I'm going to run this line. Oh, quick primer on closure. Uh, so normally, in most of the language we're languages we're familiar with, when you call a function, it's, you know, uh, we have our function name, and then we have, in parentheses, the arguments to the function, enclosure, and lists in general. We just take this first parentheses and move it outside. And the reason for that is so we can do something called macros, which I'm not going to talk about at all today. But there's good reasons for it, I promise. Um, so I'm going to evaluate this line. Oh, so I have to explain this first. So def is define what we call a var. Uh, you can kind of think of it as a variable, that, but it's a variable that can't be changed. Well, we'll get into that. So we're def defining the var file, and that will be an atom that has the contents file contents. An atom is really more like a variable. That's something that can't be changed. So I'll evaluate that. You see down there at the bottom, it said file. That's the thing I just created. Oops. 
So if I write file now, there's my atom. And then, so this is like the file on our machine that we, we think of as a file that is still the same thing even after we change it. If we want to get the contents of it, at file, so that gives us the current value of the file. Then let's say I make basically another pointer to this file, so def hard link file. So it's kind of like a hard link. So hard link is still the exact same file or atom. And then I can do get the value of it. Now, if I, oh yeah, and they're equal too. Right, so that's true, they're equal. So I'm going to evaluate this up here. So I'm defining before to be the, the value, the current value of the file. And then this is how we update an atom enclosure. We call this swap function, which takes in another function, which will, this function over here, will take in the old value of the file, which is x, and then return a modified value of it, and then store that in the atom. So I'll do that real quick. So now if I look at file, it's still, it's still the same atom. You can see the contents in there, but that's just kind of a detail of it. So if I've got, I can check and see if it's still equal to hard link. Oops. And it is. But if I look at before, that was our original value. So what I'm trying to highlight here is that the atom is the identity and the succession of values. Remember we said identities are successions of values? Or identi an identity is a succession of values? So the atom is the identity and then the actual values we extract out of it can be different at any point in time. But the identity is always still the same thing. Yeah. Oh, and then we can uh, get the out the value out of the out of file now. So we changed it, and it's different. Oops. All right. <coughs> All right, so here's another example. I'm going to just read this to you guys. This, my lord, is my family's axe. We have owned it for almost 900 years, see? Of course, sometimes it needed a new blade, and sometimes it has required a new handle, new designs on the metalwork, a little refreshing of the ornamentation. But is this not the 900-year-old axe of my family? And because it has changed gently over time, it's still a pretty good axe, you know, pretty good. So, what is the identity in, in this description here? Your family's axe, right? And then the value would be what? Yeah, the, the axe with a particular blade or put in a particular handle configuration, right. Here's another one. Uh, I hope this is how you pronounce it, but the old Greek philosopher Heraclitus said, no man can cross the same river twice because neither the man nor the river are the same. So if you, if you look at a river and you see all these, we call it a river, and we see all these molecules in this spot and you know the grass is blowing this way and the trees are blowing that way, and then we look away and we look back, well, it's a completely different river, right? It's it's not the same at all. Half the water that was up here is now down here. You know, a log started floating down, and the trees are in different configurations. It's, it's not at all the same. The identity of the river, when we say the Mississippi or the Great River, whatever we call it, is something that we made up ourselves as humans. So we're going to model that one real quick in code, too, just to drive it home. All right, whoa, 
What's up, guy? There we go. So, I'm basically doing the same thing here. We'll make our Great River atom, and then we'll say, you know, Great River and Mississippi are the same thing. And we're going to do a little concurrency, too. So, oh, I should have called it river, so I don't have to type as much. Oh, yeah, I don't know how to do that. I'm still learning Emacs. It causes me great pain. All right, so we saw up there is the, the atom of our river, so its identity. And then down here, we've got the current value of it. Uh, what this little block of code here is doing is we're calling a future. Um, so a future, we're just taking this block of code. We're saying, hey, go stick it in a thread pool and run it. So it'll return immediately, but then in some other thread, this will be happening. And we do this 120 times, sleep for a second, and then update our Great River, great river uh, identity or atom. And here's the function we use to update it. This is just saying for the collection of values in here, the 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So this, we call it a vector. It's basically an array. For that array, map the increment function over it, and then return the new one. So I'll just show you what that is real quick. Over. So Great River was 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and then map increment over was just that. So when I run this, I can say, here's our identity, and it's the same as it was before. Right? That's always true, because the identity is its own thing. But at the particular value is something that's changing over time. So constantly changing, just like when we look at a real river. <coughs> so one more example. I'll just read this one to you, too. Think of an experience from your childhood, something you remember clearly, something you can see, feel, maybe even smell, as if you were really there. After all, you were really there, weren't you? How else could you remember it? But here's the bombshell. You weren't there. Not a single atom that is in your body today was there when that event took place. Every bit of you has been replaced many times over, which is why you eat, of course. You are not even s you're not even the same shape as you were then. The point is that you are like a cloud, something that persists over long periods while simultaneously being in flux. Matter flows from place to place and momentarily comes together to be you. Whatever you are, therefore, you are not the stuff of which you are made. So they did an experiment. I know, it sounds kind of hippie, right? <laughs> but they did this experiment back in the day. This is like high on the list of experiments we wouldn't do today, where they... Uh, they fed people some radioactive food. <laughs> yeah, great, right? So they fed these people radioactive food, and, and then they came back and like measured the radioactive decay coming off their body to see if the food just like goes straight through, and a few little things are pulled out, or not. And it turns out, from that experiment, and experiments like it, they were able to conclude that over the course of a year, 90% or 98% of your body is completely replaced. It turns out there are, so this isn't entirely correct, there are a few parts of your body that stick around the, the vast, vast majority of your life. Uh, can anyone guess where those are? There's three of them. Say phone? Bone. Bone. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's <laughs> totally not true. Um, close. Uh, your teeth, which are bone. Uh, the other two are little parts of your brain and little parts of your heart, which is interesting, I thought. But, like, 
as I said before, we have this identity concept, which is something we made up, and then we have these values that change over time, just like the river. Git's another example. Uh, what's the identity in Git? Exactly, the branch or tag name, and the values would be the commits, yeah. Yep. So, we could make all our variables in our programming language just be identities that point to successive values. So, like the closure, like the closure code I was just showing. But here's the problem. Uh, that means deep copying everything, right? And deep copying is really slow. And we can't be doing that for every single tiny update. So, hey, look, I changed it already. Yep. So that's where persistent data structures come in. Persistent data structures are just a way of modifying something and not having to make a, like you can treat it as if you have a whole copy, a whole totally updated copy, but, but it doesn't take up that much space in memory, as, as much as twice the copy would have. So here we've got a tree. Uh, we've got a bunch of letters in our tree, and we want to add another node under F. So right in the middle there, we want to add E underneath F. So because this is a value, and we know it to be immutable, it will never, ever change, then we can make our new tree with a new root point to the old sections, to the sections of our old tree. So we could keep this stuff around for a long time, and a lot of the structure would be shared, and but we can still treat it as if it's a immutable values. Um, this is this is how uh, closures, all of closures, data structures work, and I think the ones in Scala as well. I think there's some people from the Scala world that came up with some of this stuff to work in Scala. A guy, a guy named Phil Bagwell, and then Rich Hickey, the founder of Closure, expanded on it and used it as the core types enclosure. So anytime you're using any core type enclosure, you're using uh, persistent data structures. Okay, so the benefits of limiting the scope of our state to just that inherent state and persistent using persistent persistent data structures are first of all concurrency is a lot easier. We can share stuff across well any any thread really like it's it's immutable so it doesn't even matter we, we, it's never going to change underneath your feet uh, we can get an instant history which is really simple uh, so if we have all our state in one spot and we're sharing if we have all our state in one spot we can just keep copies of the current state in an array and we could keep a whole bunch of them because we're sharing the structure underneath yeah How do you sync that up? Yeah, right. So, so the question is like, how does it, if you've got multiple threads working on generating new immutable values, how do those sync up, right? Yeah, yeah. So the, the approach Closure takes is uh, software transactional memory. So it's basically, you can kind of think of it as a database transaction. Um, it's, I think it's slightly different. So if you've got, say, let's write some stuff down. No, this is a good question. This is a really good question. Um, So let's say we have we have uh, two threads. They start with a number one, and the first thread reads it and says, "Hey, I'm going to make it a two. And then the second three thread reads the two and says, "Hey, I'm going to make it a four. And then the first thread 
reads the four, says I'm going to make it a three. And then let's say thread number two reads the three and wants to do some computation on it that takes a long time. But in the meantime, the first thread changes it down to a two. Well, the second thread is going to come back and before it writes, say it wanted to change it to a four again. So the second, second thread, before it writes that incremented value, it will look at the old value and see, hey, wait a minute, that's not what it used to be. So it scraps that and retries it. Yeah, 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 exactly like that, yeah. Way to put it in like three words, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then here's the other interesting thing is, uh, so, yeah, it, yeah, yeah, just like Optimus is laughing. <laughs> <laughs> so like if, if that got changed back to a three by some other thread, and then, it, and then it checked again, even though it changed, you know, to a two and then back up to a three, it would say, well, I'm going to write my value, which was based on three, then it would just write it away because it doesn't care that it changed. Okay. Well, I'm getting good at switching, aren't I? <laughs> all right, so history is really easy to get when your state's all in one place. Uh, also, there's no defensive copying because these are just values, then they're immutable, so it doesn't even make sense to copy it. You just get the exact, like, no one can ever change it, so. We don't have to worry about that. Um, and then, this is the one I think is most interesting, is uh, equals equals is a comparison of identity, and dot equals is a deep comparison to see if these things are you know, truly the same thing. Well, we don't, we don't have these in closure. It's just equals. Because we differentiate between the identity and the value, it doesn't make, make sense to say something is in the same memory location or not. It, it just doesn't matter because it's going to be uh, equals or not. What's the? You would have to. But they, they are equal. Right. Because what do we care where it is in the memory, where it is in memory? Like, so in that case, so generally, uh, equality checks in a language that uses immutable data structures, would or persistent data structures, yeah, immutable, uh, would be look at the root node. If they're the same, then they're equal. You don't have to check the whole thing down because you know it's never changed. And the point you're talking about is if you build them up in two different threads or in two different places at the same time, will they then be equal? At that point, you have to start searching down to check equality. And there's actually there's actually a function in Clojure that does check the, the memory location of something uh, called identity or identical. And basically no one ever uses it because you just don't need to. Does that answer your question? Cool. Any others? No, silence, cool. You are. Yes, there's a performance hit to this. Yep. What? Yeah. Good Good question. That's point 0.5. I'm so glad you asked. Uh, so what can be done now? Um, write pure functions whenever you can. Pure functions are just so much easier to reason about. They're easier to compose. Uh, all sorts of wonderful things. Uh, and don't modify state. Just return new versions of stuff when you can. Um, use MapReduce and Filter because they're pure functions. Uh, avoid the for loops. That just screams, hey, we're modifying state, and that makes things more confusing for all the reasons we talked about at the beginning. Um, use persistent data structures when possible. Uh, sometimes you can't when you're working with uh, other libraries and such. Um, and also, to try to differentiate between inherent state and the, or, uh, that should see essential state, and derived state. And 
it's easy to make your derived state immutable then. And then to your point, uh, persistent data structures do have a slight performance penalty. Uh, but like Donald Knuth said, uh, premature optimization is the root of all evil. So it's easy to go from a persistent data structure to a uh, mutable data structure, right? You just get the value and then you'd have to do a copy, I guess. But so when you're talking about highly performance sensitive code, you're, you're going to fall back to using mutable state because that's, that's why we used it in the first place, right? If we had infinite processing power back in the day, I, I bet they would have used immutable values all over the place. Uh, quick demo. This is the, uh, what, what are we, when are we done today? 35? Is that right? Okay. So, all right, so there's, uh, actually I'm going to show the code real quick. So I pulled this little, okay, there, well actually I'll show this first. So there's this little, uh, I can see it. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> All right, so I found this. Uh, there's this uh, closure library called Reagent. It's a thin wrapper around uh, Facebook's React.js. So this is closure code compiled into JavaScript that uses this closure library called Reagent, which uses React. Uh, basically, it encourages keeping your state all in one spot. So I found this part, where I can drag these things around, that was this demo I found. And uh, because they put all their state in one spot, then as of last night, I decided to jump in there and I made a little slider, which was pretty easy using this library. But then I synced it up so that every time the state's updated, it tosses it into an array doesn't take up too much space because it's a persistent data structure and a lot of stuff is shared. Uh, and then I hook the slider up to traverse through that array and set the core state of the app to be whatever state it was in this history. And in just a little bit of time, I got a nice little history traversal thing. And it's actually really simple to do. And the reason it was simple to do is because all the state's in one place. So. All right. All right. That's all I've got. Uh, if you're interested in Clojure, you should check out the Clojure MN user group. Or even better, look, out the foreclo look at foreclosure.org. It's one of these puzzle sites, the Cohen-style puzzles, where you just fill in the blank of some code and you it's a great way to learn Clojure. It's how I learned it. Uh, also, the company I'm working at is called Vidku, and we're hiring front-end, back-end, uh, Android, and iOS developers. We have postings on tech.mn, so check that out as well. Any questions? Yo. Um, yeah. Ah, uh, yeah. I'm trying to remember. It's been a while since I've thought about these. So cursors are something. So Mutable JS is by Facebook, and uh, a guy named David Nolan made this wrapper, kind of like Reagent, around Facebook's React, and he wanted to make all the. Why did he add cursors? Oh, he wanted to have all, okay, so in React, you have all your state at the top, except for each of these components can have their own state. So you put the core state of your application at the root level, and then components like, you know, selecting tabs or moving a slider, maybe they would have uh, local state. I think selecting tabs is a really good one, because that's not relevant to your application. It's just the state of the interface. So they would have their state inside this component, so a little deeper in the, the DOM. And David wanted to make a simple way to actually have all your states at the top. So when you're passing a cursor down 
through these functions that build up the interface, it keeps a reference to the top, and I don't remember well, how it works exactly. Yeah. Yes, which which you could do normally by just referencing the global variable right. and dereferencing that yeah. or using the values out of there. Uh, I remember now one of the things that he needed uh, cursors for, not necessarily reference cursors, but cursors for was because if you use a component in multiple places, then say, say I've got a component over here that uh, uses, you know, a string in your main piece of state. Well, then you want to use that component again somewhere else. Well, it still needs a string to work with. And if it references directly that global, that, that uh, root level state, well, then they'd have a conflict. They'd try to use the same string, but we want them to be separate. So cursors, I believe, keep track of a path to a particular location yeah. in your uh, global atom or piece of mutable state. And so each component knows its path down to that piece of state. And so in order to stop the conflict from happening there, I believe that's what it was for. And then reference cursors, I don't remember what that addition was. Yeah. Anything else? Cool. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>